Hello, and welcome to the Understanding Social Capital webinar series. This is a pre-recorded webinar series provided by the Office of Family Assistance within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This, this is sponsored by the EYES Project, which is led by Public Strategies, MDRC, and Empath. My name is Damon Waters, and I'm a, I'm a Family Assistance Program Specialist and Contract Lead for the EYES Project. This webinar series is a part of, a, of the EYES Emerging Practices series that seeks to highlight the strategies being deployed by TANF agencies and their partners to address the needs of TANF clients seeking to gain and sustain meaningful employment. I'm excited that you've chosen to take part in this series. As a reminder, this is the first session of a three-part series. Feel free to listen at your own pace or binge watch all at once. All staff are welcome to join from direct service providers to administrative leads and anyone in between. This first session will provide the major highlights of social capital as it relates to current research. To give you a sneak preview, sessions two and three will dive deeper to provide strategies for integrating social capital into your program's day-to-day -day routine to improve the outcomes for individuals you serve. Now I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jack Myrick at Public Strategies who will be moderating this session. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Damon. And as he mentioned, I'm Jack Myrick, and I'm with Public Strategies in Oklahoma City. And I'm a career and development specialist, and I, I help co-develop the Work Forward program, which is a 40-hour transition, uh, career transition curriculum, and also help co-develop the Winning the Workplace Challenge, a relationship education curriculum that we use and uh, others around the country use to integrate with workforce programs. But I'm really excited because I get to uh, introduce Jennifer Lowe, who's going to be our content expert today. And Jennifer serves as the Vice President of Shared Learning and Member Networks at Economic Mobility Pathways, which a lot of us uh, call EMPATH in Boston, Massachusetts. And she leads the organization's Economic Mobility Exchange, which is a global member-based learning network of over 100 nonprofits and government agencies. Jennifer has uh, authored Social Networks as an Anti-Poverty Strategy. That's how I first met her. And then she's co-authored From Opportunity to Burden, Profiles of Low-Income Households Caught in the Credit Trap. Uh, she's also co-authored Massachusetts Economic Independence Exit, uh, Index. So welcome, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Damon, and thanks so much, Jack. I'm really excited to be here today um, to share with you a little bit more about uh, social capital and social networks. So I'm hoping that um, in today's webinar, we will be able to gain an understanding of what social networks are and what social capital is and really why they matter, um, and ultimately to learn what, which factors really influence our social networks and social capital and where those disparities might exist. So what I think it's really a, kind of a prelude to this webinar is how we actually met. We were in D.C. And I didn't know you. I had just read your paper on another project and uh, was at a conference in D.C. on a completely different subject and was really, in, uh, really impressed by the, uh, the social networks as an anti-poverty strategy paper that you wrote. And so I still, it was still pretty top of mind. And I'm standing at Starbucks, which is across the street from the hotel, and I happened to notice, I uh, couldn't remember who wrote the paper, but I remembered that it was written by somebody at Empath. And I noticed on your name tag that you had Empath. And so I just asked, I said, hey, I just read this really cool paper on social capital. <laughs> And it's from a lady at Empath. Would you happen to know who that might be? And Jennifer said, yeah, it was me. And so um, what's really interesting is that uh, we had a great conversation throughout the conference about social capital, thinking nothing would ever come of it. And then six months later, here we are doing a webinar on it. So I think it's kind of a great <laughs> example of how social networking and social capital isn't a, something you plan a lot. And I think you'll probably dive into some of that. So, um, so what are some of the goals we're going to look at today, uh, Jennifer, as we move forward in the webinar? Sure, yeah. So, so um, like I mentioned, one of the goals that we have is to really gain an understanding of what social networks are and what social capital is and why they matter and then really learn what factors influence our social networks and social capital and where disparities exist. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So can you kind of expand a little bit on, you know, social networks and social capital kind of sound the same? Can you kind of expand a little bit on the difference of the two? Yeah, I can. And actually, Jack, I'm going to use your example of how we met, um, if, if that's okay. Because I, I, I remember sure. that day, and I think it was a great example of how the people in our in our world can really help us um, and, and how that social capital um, can really open up some opportunities. And so um, a social network, the definition of social network is really, it's that, um, it's defined as that interconnected group or association of people and organizations. So these are the people and the organizations in your life and they're referred to as social ties. So Jack, you are a perfect example of somebody within my social network, a tie in my social network because you're a colleague that I met at that conference in DC. Um, and then while there are a lot of ways in which people define the term social capital, for today's conversation, I'm going to use the definition that it really refers to the social value that's generated by and the resources that are found within our social network. Um, and so some examples of those are information, opportunities, trust, favor, goodwill, reciprocity. And so Jack, in our situation, um, that social capital that you brought into my world was you opened up a great opportunity for me to share and talk a little bit more with a larger group of people about these, these exact concepts, social capital and social networks. Fine. So I, I'm hoping that um, we, can, we can expand on what social capital and social networks mean by reflecting on our own personal experiences in our lives. So I'm hoping that you all will take a moment to reflect on a time when you either helped someone or someone helped you. And you can use any example in your life. It could be maybe professionally or personally or academically. And so as you're reflecting on your own experience, I'm going to share with you an example that took place here at Empath a few years ago, just so we have a, a shared experience to draw from as well. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to share with you a story about a, a student in one of our workforce development programs. Her name is Maria. And at the time, uh, this program recruited volunteers from the community to pair up students and provide them with career guidance and mentoring. And the volunteer that we paired up with Maria was employed in a human resources department at a local insurance agency. And Maria was actually happened to be interested in pursuing a career in the healthcare field. So it was a really nice pairing of the two. Um, and after working together over the course of the program, the volunteer offered Maria an internship position which of course she accepted and she really did great at this position. And as a result, Maria was offered a paid full-time job. And so now I'd like you to reflect again on your own experience of helping someone or being helped by someone. Was this person in your life, is they, were they somebody that you were close to? So did you consider this person um, part of your inner circle? or perhaps they were more of an acquaintance to you. And so those people that we refer to, um, those people who are part of our inner circle or that we're really close to, we refer to those people as strong ties. And these are the people in our lives that we really have a high level of emotional investment with, and we typically have a lot in common with these people. So these are the people in our lives that we might consider being some of our closest confidants, our dearest friends, our family members, our partners. But if you think about Maria's example, that volunteer who helped her, she wasn't a strong tie. She wasn't someone that Maria was close to. In fact, she was an acquaintance. So she was somebody she met through Empath and knew for maybe 12 weeks, which is the duration of the, the workforce development program that she participated in. And so the people that we really aren't close with our acquaintances, in the literature, we refer to that as weak ties. And those are the ties that are, are those are the, the relationships that we form that tend to have little emotional investment and typically we don't have as much in common with these folks as we would with maybe our strong ties. And so thinking again back on your own experience of either helping someone or having someone help you, what type of assistance or guidance was provided? Was this a time when you maybe helped or someone helped you to get ahead in life, like a job opportunity or career advice or school advice, something to help you move forward or become economically mobile? If so, this type of assistance 
we refer to as providing leverage, right? It helps you get ahead. Or maybe it was a time when you helped someone or someone helped you to just simply get by. And I don't mean just simply, but really getting by in life. Um, you know, maybe they provided emotional support. They borrowed money from you or you lent somebody money. They helped out with a car repair, maybe babysitting. All these types of assistance are referred to as providing support. So support helps us get by, whereas leverage helps us get ahead, become economically mobile. And so if you think back in Maria's case, the resource or the assistance that was provided by the volunteer that helped Maria um, was resource that helped her get ahead, right? She offered her an internship that eventually led to a job. The volunteer provided that leverage for her. Um, it leveraged, she was able to help leverage her connections to help Maria advance in her career and become economically mobile. So now that you reflected on your own experience and then together we reflected on Maria's experience, you may already have an idea as to why our social networks, who you know, matters, right? So think about all the different social circles that you're a part of, all the various people and all the different organizations who are part of your social network, right? Like our community organizations, our friends, our coworkers, our family, our neighbors, right? So Jack was part of my social network. Um, the connections that we have with others have been found to influence a wide variety of aspects of our life. They influence our health, they influence our economic mobility, our status attainment, so much in, in our life. So we have all these ties and, and you're talking about it in a very positive context. Are there some negative aspects to social networks, you know, the people in our lives that are negative? Yeah, Jack, that, that's a good question. Yes. <laughs> yep, um, it is. So that's another aspect of social networks, and it's a good one to talk about. Um, oftentimes we refer to that characteristic, that, that um, characteristic of our relationships where it might be a little negative. Um, those, those ties in our life are called ties that drain or draining ties. And so those are the relationships that we might have in our lives that really deplete us of our resources. And, and that could be a wide variety of resources. That could be financial resources, right? So maybe somebody's asking to borrow money a lot um, and, and maybe not paying us back, right? Or asking a lot of favors of us, um, but aren't reciprocating those favors. Um, so it really kind of depletes our financial resources, but it also could deplete our emotional resources. So if you think of draining ties, they could also be maybe relationships in our lives that have negative attitudes or there's a lot of emotional drama or they're complaining a lot um, or it's just general unsupportive behavior. And, and I think it's important to you know, note that we all of us have some kind of combination of people in our lives and many of us have both strong ties and weak ties and those strong ties and weak ties in our lives could also be peppered with people or relationships that are draining on us. And so, 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 yeah, so Jennifer, sorry. let's just uh, pause for a second and let's yeah. say we have a caseworker that's working with a client and this, you know, they feel like this client has some really positive outlooks uh, in their future as far as employment and life in general, but they realize that there is a, a draining relationship uh, in their life. Maybe it's a mother, maybe it's a boyfriend, you know, or a neighbor, yep. but there's somebody in their life that's really draining and holding them back. How would you coach the coach on how to talk to that client about that relationship and setting some boundaries? What would be some language you would use uh, to help them have that conversation? Yeah, Jack, that's, that's a good question, right? Because we know that for folks who are living in poverty who might have limited resources, those draining relationships can put a major strain on um, their resources that are already very strained. And so if I were a coach or if I would give some advice to a coach on how to help someone in that situation, I would say, um, you know, maybe help them identify what those draining behaviors look like. Um, so if they're coming to you and sharing those stories and sharing that it's, you know, it's really becoming a problem for them, um, helping to support them in deciding what boundaries they want to create with people who are exhibiting those draining behaviors. Because I think it's important. Um, I think relationships are complicated, right? And so although we might have an opinion on 
what maybe that person should do. It really, it's important for them to decide what what boundary they want to draw, you know, whether it be, um, you know, maybe they don't want that person in their life anymore, or maybe they still want that person in their life. Maybe it's a close family member that's draining, um, but maybe they put a little bit more boundaries on um, that person, or maybe that person is still asking for resources, but that the the person that you're working with is setting saying no, um, and so. What a coach could do is help them in that effort. You know, once they define or decide where they want to place boundaries, a coach can help them in that. And I think one, one nice way to do this is it could even include something like role playing. So if there's a common situation, like for example, maybe someone is concerned that their brother is always asking for money and he never pays it back, and now that person is really struggling to pay their own rent or utilities or food, and they're sharing that with you, they're sharing that with you as a coach, um, a coach can really help that person by role playing that situation and they can practice how they might handle it when that when that request comes up again and they can work through it together so that that person the next time the brother asks for resources or money they feel confident in how they're going to respond and they've they've practiced it out with their coach and I think I think that would be helpful um, in doing very good advice I think oh thanks Jack all right so so we talked a little bit about um, social networks, but <laughs> but but what's you know why why do they matter, right? It's because of this concept of social capital, right? So remember that this concept refers to the social value that's generated by and the resources found within our social network. So examples of this could be trust, reciprocity information, influence, support, opportunities, favors, all of that um, sort of resource and social value that, that we get just by being connected to a large group of people or organizations. And so those people that we are close to, right, remember our strong ties, they provide what's called bonding social capital the strong relationships that we have with a group of people that are very close to us, and they typically, we typically have a lot of interaction with these people. So these people are going to be the people in our lives that we often go to to provide some of that material or emotional support, all of that support that might help us get by. So the strong ties, the people that we're closest with, help us get by, and that's called bonding social capital. And so our, our acquaintances, you know, remember that term weak ties, those are often associated with what's called bridging social capital. They introduce us or bridge us to new social circles and the resources that are found within those new circles that we might otherwise not have access to. Um, and so these are often associated with helping us get ahead. And so as you think back on your own experience, I'm wondering if, if this rings true for you. Was it a weak tie or an acquaintance that provided bridging social capital or helped you get ahead? Or, or perhaps when you reflected back on your experience, maybe it was a strong tie, maybe a family member or a close friend that provided bonding social capital and really helped you get by. And I just want to point out here that these distinctions are not always black and white. Um, you might have a close friend, that strong tie that that connected you to a job or helped you get ahead, um, that bridging capital. So just you know, be mindful that although um, we talk about it in distinction, there, there might be some blending in between. And so when you think about Maria's situation, um, the volunteer that she was paired with really helped introduce her or bridge her to a new social circle by introducing Maria to her colleagues at the insurance company, which ultimately led Maria to a job offer. Um, and so now Maria was connected not only to her social circle at Empath, at the workforce development program that she was participating in, but also to the people that she met through working at the insurance company. So all of a sudden, she got bridged to this completely new world, um, and her social circle or her network has now been expanded. So as you can imagine, social networks that are large and diverse, so meaning that there are more people that you know, um, and the more people that you know from different social circles, the greater chances we have to actually learn of new opportunities, new information, new influences, new resources that we can, we can really harness to, to make economic advancements and, and really get ahead. So Jennifer, how does the social media 
uh, kind of factor into all this. You know, I'm looking at the slide and I'm seeing all these people, and I'm, it just kind of reminds me of Facebook. I mean, how does the social media aspect relate to all this? Yeah, that's a good question. That's and a good question, ties. Jack. Yeah, I think I think social media. You know, when we think of social media, whether it be Facebook or Instagram or uh, LinkedIn, those I see as vehicles to help us communicate with our social networks, right? Those relationships and people in our lives, and some of them are really geared towards a particular type of network, right? So, for example, you know, when I think of LinkedIn, I think of LinkedIn as a place to really build up your um, your weak ties, right? The ties that you have with colleagues in such a wide variety of fields, and people actively use their LinkedIn accounts to be able to get ahead, right? To be able to provide those leveraging ties. Um, and then I, I might say that other social media accounts like Facebook, I think people tend to use more um, socially, um, but they might have a wide variety of people in their Facebook or in their um, Instagram accounts that could be a combination of strong ties and weak ties. But I think they're both great ways of sharing information, um, sharing opportunities, um, sharing resources. I mean, and I say great, but for the good and for the bad, potentially. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. That, that's a great question. Um, so I, I just, I also wanted to point out, and, and Jack, you brought this up earlier about some of the negative effects of social capital um, or, or social networks. I also wanted to point out that, you know, while we talk a lot about social capital um, for its positive effects as maybe helping us get by or helping us get ahead, um, it can sometimes have a negative aspect to it. And so I want to just share a quick example of this. Uh, years ago, I had interviewed a director at a local community health organization here in Boston um, who shared with me that uh, a few years back during a time when, the, when mortgages uh, for homes were less restricted and a little bit more abundant and easier to come by, um, some of the local, local mortgage brokers actually um, infiltrated some of the local churches and used their social capital, so all of the trust and reputation that they developed with other parishioners um, to pitch some of these unrealistic, faulty mortgages to their fellow churchgoers, which was a very predatory practice. But they really kind of capitalized on the social capital that are found within um, these communities, the trust and reputation that they were able to build up. And so this community health organization had to step in and provide some home buyer and financial education and counseling to the community members to offset some of the misinformation and some of those predatory products that were flowing through the churches and other community institutions. So while we talk a lot about um, some of the positive effects of social capital, just I think just always keep in mind and remember that it, it can also be um, misused. Um, it might have some negative effects as well. Okay, um, so we talked a lot about social capital, but, but how do you actually activate or mobilize all of this great social capital, all of the resources um, and social value that, that you might have within your network? Um, and so research has found that relationships that um, are high in social capital often have some level of trust, right? So the belief in and the reliance on honesty, integrity, and reliability of other people or there's a level of um, reciprocity, meaning that there's some kind of mutual benefit um, or fairness from the relationship over time. Um, if you help me, I'll help you. Um, you know, we kind of give it back and forth to each other. Or there's some level of durability, right, so that we have um, relationships that might last over time, whether we go through stressful situations or changing circumstances, we still have a relationship. And so, meaning that if someone in our life might come to us for something, chances are that we'd be more willing to help them out if we had a certain level of trust in them, or there might be an expectation that we might get a favor back, or a favor might be returned, that reciprocity, or that we, uh, you know, maybe it's somebody that we've known for a long time, that durability of relationships. And so I think day to day we see this play out. Um, if, if someone's looking for a new career, um, they're often encouraged to reach out into their social networks to see if people would be willing to give them advice or not on their next steps or maybe 
set up an informational interview or pass along a job opening or introduce them to a hiring manager or maybe even hire them. And this might work really well if it's a reputable person that's trusted by the, the people and the relationships that they have in their social network. But research has shown that even for some people who actually do have a large social network and might have job contacts in their network, if, there, if there's not trust or those interpersonal dynamics like reputation or skepticism or perceived lack of motivation, if, if that's there, it's going to inhibit their ability to really activate and mobilize the social capital within the network, right? They, they might have a network that has job contacts, but if they're not a trusted person or if, they're, if they don't have a good reputation, the people in their network might not be willing to help them get ahead. And so we saw this play out at Empath, and I, I wanted to give you an example just to, to understand how that works. Um, again, back in the same workforce development program, we had a student, her name was Luz, um, or I'm going to, it's her name for, these, the, for this purpose, <laughs> um, and she had an accounting deg a degree and she was new to the country, um, and she was really having a hard time finding work. And so we paired up Luz with a volunteer who worked at a financial firm here in Boston. We thought it would be a great connection, um, given her accounting degree and wanting to work in that field. And so the volunteer, um, she arranged a job interview with her colleagues for Luz, but Luz never showed up for the interview and, and didn't call. And so as a result, that volunteer might have damaged her reputation with her colleagues by asking them to interview someone who didn't show up. And as a result, Luz's reputation with this volunteer was tarnished, and, she, and, and this volunteer was no longer willing to set up more interviews for Luz. And so in this situation, although Luz had a network that included really well-connected people in positions who could help her out and who could advance her career, those interpersonal dynamics of reputation and, and perhaps distrust or maybe a perceived lack of motivation really inhibited Luz from being able to take advantage of the rich social capital within her network. So it was really sort of an unfortunate um, situation, but I think just to be mindful that if you can create um, trust or reciprocity or if you've known people for a long time, um, that tends to be when you can really activate that, that social capital. So there's other factors um, that can contribute to mobilizing or activating our social ties. And so continuing with Maria's example, um, Maria's network included the people that she interacted with in the workforce development program, and this included empath staff, it included volunteers, it included her own classmates, and she had frequent contact with the teachers in the program, her fellow classmates. They, they met for full days, five days a week for 12 weeks, right? So this high level of contact and interaction. And then further, Maria regularly interacted with a group of volunteers that came together for these monthly luncheons and connected regularly on the phone, email, and in person to be able to provide that advice and guidance. So this, this char characteristic of having high level of interaction, um, but also not just high level interaction, but one that really um, very intentionally tried to include activities that were designed to connect people, connect them over their aspirations, their experiences, their shared resources. And because of that, Maria was able to develop relationships with people that she met at the organization. And so as these relationships developed, Maria was able to just discuss her goals, her challenges, her interests, her aspirations, and that allowed her to be able to share her experience in trying to find work in the medical field, um, and that she was ready to pursue a job but was having difficulty getting her foot in the door. And so when that volunteer heard that, she was able to connect Maria to, that, to a job opening or to that internship opening. But she wouldn't have been able to do that unless there was that opportunity provided, unless she got connected to Maria, and unless there was that opportunity to actually have Maria share a little bit about herself and share a little bit about some of those challenges. Um, so I, I share all that to, you know, just to encourage, I think, organizations um, to really think about what you can do, or agencies, to really think about what you can do to, to help bridge or connect people um, to different social worlds or different opportunities that they might not have access to. 
Um, and then I just wanted to cover a couple of other factors that tend to influence our social network. So influence who is in our life, um, and then thusly would influence the social capital that we'd be able to, to access. Um, so one of them is geography, right? Just simply, who are the people in your neighborhood? <laughs> um, who are you surrounded by every day? Are, are you isolated? Um, is your neighborhood one that might be socially isolated, politically isolated, um, maybe it's hard to move around because of transportation, or maybe you live in a neighborhood where neighbors socialize a lot, and that's wonderful because then you can connect to a group of people. Or perhaps you live in a neighborhood where people keep to themselves and it might limit the connections that you're able to make. make. Um, or even the streets, like are the streets, do they feel safe to move around and connect with others? Another, another factor is education. Um, I think just, you know, plugging into different educational opportunities is going to introduce you to more people. It's going to expose you to diverse subject matters, ideas, opportunities. And the same with labor market. Um, you know, are you, are, are you connected to the labor market? Are you employed? Um, and if you're employed, then you, you're able to not only get connected to maybe people that you work with at your organization or your agency, but also the colleagues um, within your organization's network, right? So in, in Jack's example, in my example, um, not only am I employed here at Empath, and I know my Empath colleagues, but because of that, because of my employment here, I was able to meet Jack at, over at Public Strategies. And so just working already has exposed me to broader networks. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to point out that gender has also, research has shown that gender can also be a factor that influences our social networks. Um, so oftentimes, parenting young children, research has shown that child rearing influences the sizes particularly of women's social networks differently than men. So having a child, particularly a young child, can significantly negatively impact the size of a woman's social network, but has no effect on men's network size. So how would um, being connected with their child's school, how would that impact their social network? Oh, yeah, Jack, that's a good question, right? Because that would be maybe a school-age child. Um, you know, I think for mothers um, of older children or maybe school-age children, that might not necessarily be the case. But um, I think when, when, you're, uh, when you're parenting a young child, um, particularly in those early months, um, that, could be, that could be really difficult to maybe, uh, it might limit your ability to socialize outside of the home or connect with others outside of the home. But I think certainly when you talk about school-age children and able to plug into um, maybe a whole network within the school, which is perhaps a new network when you have a child um, who's going to school for the first time, um, maybe a different network of parents and teachers um, and other staff that you're, you're suddenly able to, to, to broaden your, your relationships with. You know, and I just I wanted to um, maybe point out too just one other example of a factor that could influence our social network, um, and this is an, a, a factor that negatively impacts our social network, and that's discrimination. Um, so there was a case study done of employers in Brooklyn, New York, um, and it was a particular neighborhood that had high concentrations of poverty, and researchers found that the employers in that neighborhood use their social networks to fill jobs, but because of some racial and place-based discrimination, local residents at the time were not connected to their employer's networks, and so it resulted in employers hiring from outside the neighborhood. So this is a case where um, that, that factor of discrimination trumped the factor of geography. So just, I just want to point out both maybe positive and negative influences on our social networks. So I want to just finish up by talking about the social networks of low-income people. Um, so when we think about people living in poverty, there might be some who might feel, who might feel isolated. Um, so I interviewed a director of a program serving formerly homeless adults, and one of the main focuses of that program was to get people plugged into a community of others, since the people that they served really didn't seem to have a robust social network of close ties that they could turn to in times of need. And the fear was that without a safety net of supportive, close relationships to provide those critical resources and support, to get by day to day, if a crisis came up, 
um, the people that they were serving might find themselves in a really vulnerable situation and could um, could fall into uh, experiencing homelessness again. But that that's, I think, more of an extreme example. Um, but generally, the research has shown us that people living in poverty, um, they tend to have limited access to weak ties. So remember, weak ties are those relationships with people from other social circles who can help us get ahead. Um, and their networks tend to be a little bit more limited, um, smaller, and more homogenous than their higher income counterparts. And so you might have heard of this term of birds of a feather flock together, and that's a concept referred to as homophily, um, which is a tendency to associate and connect with other people who are like us, other similar people. Um, but when you do that, when you connect with other similar people, you find that you have um, a network that's same socio-demographic, same behavioral, same interpersonal characteristics, and so while they find, while the research has shown that um, people who, uh, who are living in poverty might not have access to weak ties, there was actually a researcher, um, Carol Stack, in her book, All My Kin, um, she really shared that for some people living in poverty, they actually tend to have a really intricate web of strong ties, so people that they can rely on to get by day to day. Um, so people who can pitch in and help out, babysit each other's children, provide milk, money for the bus, and often community and building community in this way tends to be a survival technique um, for many people to get those resources um, and support themselves to survive day to day um, given the stressors of poverty. And so I just wanted to um, to mention that because I think that's a really important, a really important concept to, to review. So we have these uh, people living in poverty. How can they, you know, I know we're about out of time, but how can they expand their social networks and grow their social capital a little bit? Just a couple quick pointers before we wrap it up. Sure. Yeah, good question, Jack. Um, I think just very intentionally, if you're an organization that's serving people living in poverty, um, create ways to help them connect with other people, whether it be peers so that they can develop um, a peer network of people that they can go to and help support them, but also find ways to help them get ahead and connect with people who are outside their social circles. So whether you have community group meetings, maybe bring in some outside um, experts who can come in that they can talk to um, or outside people who they can connect to for career advice or education advice. Um, or even another organization, actually um, Washington DC TANF offices do a really nice um, eco mapping with people. So they'll, they'll when they work with folks, they'll, they'll map out all of the different people in their, in their lives and use that to help reflect on when they're developing goals of who can you help with um, to, as a resource to be able to help you achieve your goal, which I thought was a really brilliant idea. Well, thank you, Jennifer. This has been really very informative and, and gave me lots of things to think about, and I'm sure the people that are listening to this also. And uh, I just want to encourage people to go to the next session in this series, and uh, it's a, a, available on the site. And we're going to be discussing on the, on the next one, we're going to be discussing the people, places, and practice, uh, people understanding my own social capital, the personal, community, and institutional piece of it, and then places, getting proximate to people that help us grow, and then practices, leveraging social capital uh, to be a change maker. And I would just like to add, uh, if you want to contact Jennifer and have any more comments or questions about it, you can uh, contact her at uh, JLo. Just had to throw that in. Didn't think I could make it to the end of the webinar without <laughs> saying JLo. And uh, she's at JLo at empathways.org. And um, just hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Oh, by the way, the, um, the link to Jennifer's paper is in the description part of the webinar. So everybody have a wonderful day.